Hi everyone, this is Peter. You may have noticed in our main discussion episodes, we refer to stories that Izzy and I have written, and yet you can't actually read those stories. What we've decided to do is record us reading them for you, so that way you can have some context for our discussions and really get a sense of you know what we're talking about and what kind of things we're writing. Our goal for these is to pair each discussion episode with a recording of us reading either like a section of a story or, you know, whatever we happen to be talking about that week, um, with the exception of things that we might be discussing with guests. So moving forward, there will be two episodes that kind of go together, a discussion episode and an episode in which one of us reads whatever we are discussing that week. This episode will consist of me reading the first short story in my set of stories about Panna and Wave Skimmer, and I hope that you enjoy. Thank you so much. Panna ran as fast as they could, their feet pushing through huge banks of snow. The standard Yorback hide boots that most villagers wore weren't enough to keep the wet chill from seeping into Pana's toes and up through their legs. As if matters hadn't already been bad, Pana had run out of the door before they were able to grab their warmest coat. There hadn't been any time. It began to snow. A few light flakes floated around Pana's head, gently falling to lay on top of the already massive snow banks. After a few moments, a gust of wind nearly pushed Panna onto their back, tossing thick globs of snow and ice into their face. Panna threw their hands above their face, shielded their eyes, still trying to move forward. Were they moving? They really couldn't tell. Panna was too distracted to notice that they could no longer feel their legs. Vision was no longer useful. All that existed was the white of the snow and the black of the back of their eyelids as the gale forced them to blink. Even if they were moving, Panna couldn't tell where they were moving to. Panna fell over. Their foot had gone deeper into the snow than they had realized, and they didn't have the energy to lift it out. Tugging to the left and then the right, Panna tried to dislodge their foot to no avail. They leaned forward and grabbed the snow with their hands as if to pull themselves out. But their arms were just as useless as their legs. Instead of freeing themselves, Panna lay face down on the snow. And then, suddenly, they were moving again. Not walking, but rolling. Rolling down the hill of snow that they had climbed without noticing. Panna closed their eyes. There was no point wondering how their foot had come loose from the snow. Falling down the hill didn't hurt. There were no trees to bounce into, no shrubs to avoid, no icicles that threatened to impale them. In fact, it felt good. As they fell, they let themselves go limp, relinquishing whatever desire they had for control. Control was not something familiar to Pana, though they tried their best to retain some sense of it in their life, never admitting that they had none, never giving up the hope of... the hope of something better... Pana hadn't noticed at first that they had stopped falling. How long had it been? Maybe a few seconds? The wind had stopped blowing. It screamed nearby, but Pana couldn't feel it. Were they so cold that they could no longer feel the sting of the wind? Opening their eyes, Pana looked up at the ceiling of a cave. The cave may have been constructed of rock, but it had been so ensconced in ice that there was really no way of knowing what the original structure was made of. Even the walls and the floor seemed to be coated in ice, though there was a sprinkling of snow near the cave entrance. There would be no climbing out of that entrance. It was above Pana. They had fallen through it. Vertically. A pile of snow descended from the entrance like a slide, but it was too steep to climb up. Upon his condition, it was impossible. This cave would be the last place Panna ever saw. Of that, they were certain. And, somehow, that was okay. Death had been a real possibility when Panna had set out. But now, it was set in stone. 
knowing how their story would end, and knowing they had made it out of the fate that awaited them if they had remained in the village was wonderful. In a way, they were free. The ice appeared to sparkle. It was beautiful, really, not unlike the waves of the ocean during the month in which it wasn't frozen. They would rise and then fall near the shore as if they were trying to scoop light out of the atmosphere. More light would just reflect off of the top of the waves. It took a moment for Pana to think about why the ice was sparkling. Without moving their head, they glanced to the side. The icy ceiling deeper in the cave was not just sparkling. The blue light reflecting off of it seemed to be flowing over the ice, constantly moving. With all the energy they had remaining, Pana managed to flop onto their side. Some sort of light was emanating from deeper in the cave, but Pana couldn't see the source. They tried to crawl forward, tried to imagine moving their arms and dragging them across the ice in the hopes that something would happen, but couldn't. They tried to yell. Something came out of their mouth, some sort of strangled rasp. Cold air scorched the inside of their throat. A noise came from the back of the cave. Even without knowing what was back there, Pana felt a drop of energy fall back into their being, just enough to speak in a loud whisper, Please. With their head lying on the ice, they could only hope that something heard them. Something scraped against the floor like five knives sliding out of sheaths. The sound bounced through the cave, coming from every direction at the same time. The light also grew closer. It reflected off the wall, then the other side of the cave, and then the floor. Soon, Pana was enveloped in light. Their eyes burned. Pana closed them, but still, the light hit them. All they could see was white. It was like being in the blizzard all over again. And then, the light dimmed. It no longer hurt. Pana opened their eyes. If they had the energy to smile, they would have done so. It's you, they thought. A deep green eye stared at them. It blinked and then rose out of sight. A new wind began to blow. This one was gentle and warm. Pana wouldn't freeze here. They would be okay. They and the dragon. Sab, Dad is expecting us. It's going to be dark soon. Oh, come on, Ezra. There's still plenty of light. We have all the time in the world. The two children jogged through the forest, avoiding the worst of the snow. Though the 400-foot-tall dawn trees kept most of the snow from settling beneath their branches, enough of it still managed to find its way to the ground to form piles almost as tall as Ezra. Luckily, there weren't that many of them. Sab, who was running ahead of Ezra, turned back. Besides, she said, with a hint of a grin, you love Jinro nuts. Ezra grumbled something that sounded like, Well, maybe. Sab laughed and turned to face forward again, leading them through the maze of snow piles. Beneath the dawn trees, other plants grew, protected from the harshest of the elements by their towering trunks and extensive branch networks. There was one area of the forest where the dawn tree branches were so thick the ground remained free of snow year-round. Sab and Ezra called it the summer. Their father had told them that summer once referred to a period of time in which things weren't covered in snow. For a few months, the temperatures were above freezing. Nothing like that existed here, where it snowed almost all year. There was a month where things were slightly warmer, and the snow wasn't as thick, but it was nothing like the summers their father spoke of. This patch of forest that was free from snow was the closest thing to imagining what a summer might look like. It was also the only place where Jinro trees grew. Unlike the Dawn trees, Jinro's grew close to the ground. They rose up a few feet, then turned back towards the ground before twisting in various other directions, more like a rope lazily tossed on the floor than a majestic tree. But Sab and Ezra thought they were beautiful. Hidden in the middle of leaf clusters lay the Jinro nuts. They were pale, green, and hard as rocks. In fact, it took a rock, sometimes two, to crack them open. It was hard work, but worth it. 
The creamy liquid held inside was sweet and warm. The trees emanated heat, and the hard shell of the nut contained it, keeping the liquid warm. Stepping into the heat of the Jinro trees was like approaching a dying fire. As Ezra approached them, he held out his hands and gave a contented sigh. Good thing we listened to you and went home, teased Sab. Good thing you have such a good little brother who is willing to sacrifice his own wants so that you can be happy. Sab laughed and gave Ezra a gentle shove. After they warmed up a bit, they walked around the summer collecting Jinro nuts. Even the outsides of the shells were warm. Sab and Ezra stored them in various pockets, using them as a sort of makeshift shield of warmth. Just as Sab was putting a Jinro nut into the last empty pocket she had, she heard something. It wasn't a growl necessarily, but it was deep. Did you hear that? she asked Ezra. Hear what? he asked. She turned her head around, looking through the trees. The light was fading but it was still bright enough to see. Only, there was nothing out of the ordinary to see. Sab shook her head. Nothing, she said. Just imagining things. Let's go back home. As she turned to go, the sound came again. This time, it was Ezra who asked. Did you hear that? They looked at each other. Ezra dropped a Jinro nut. The sound came again. This time, it was almost like a cry. Sab had heard that noise before. She and Ezra had once found a dog hidden in a bush. It had been injured and was crying out in the hopes that someone would hear it. Luckily, they had been around to find it and brought it home. The cry came again. It seemed to come from a particularly large mound of snow a few feet outside of the summer. Come on, whispered Sab, motioning to her brother. When he wouldn't move, she grabbed his arm and dragged him forward with her. They reached the snow mound, but saw no sign of whatever was in distress, though the sound kept ringing out. Walking around the snow, they found no sign of footprints. I don't get it, said Ezra. Are we going crazy? I don't think so, said Sab, as they heard yet another cry. There's something out there, somewhere. I just wish we knew where it was. We could help it. But she was beginning to lose hope. If the creature didn't want to be found, then there was nothing they could do. What had started as a fun trip to one of their favorite places for one of their favorite foods had now become a sad moment of despair. Sab felt a tear falling down her cheek, freezing to ice just before it reached her mouth. Ezra grabbed her hand and they stood together for a moment, staring at the snow pile as if imagining the poor crying creature lying hidden beneath the snow. It took them a moment to realize that what they thought had been snow was actually staring right back at them. Dad! Dad! Come quick! Naka put down the log he had been carrying with his right arm and gripped the axe in his left hand a little tighter. He ran from behind the house to the front. Zab, he called. What's... His jaw dropped. Sab and Ezra were leading what could only be a dragon down the front path between fields of frozen vegetables. The dragon's white scales sparkled like snow in the moonlight, and its claws gouged thin trenches in the hard earth. Sab and Ezra ran forward. Naka went to hug them, but they jumped out of his grasp. Dad, Sab said, you have to help them. Them, he asked. The dragon? The what? I don't understand. Ezra said, Not the dragon, them! He pointed at something on the dragon's back. A limp person whose brown skin had taken on a blue tinge. Their limp body swayed with every step the dragon took. One look at the cold, unconscious person told Naka that he didn't need to understand. Let's get the human inside the barn, he told his kids. The dragon let out what could only be described as a sigh of relief. It lowered itself to the ground so that Naka could grab the human and lift them over his shoulders. He stopped for a moment and looked at the dragon. The human will be all right. Don't you worry. To his astonishment, the dragon's scales turned a light green. 
it breathed once on Naka, warming his very bones. Naka nodded, and he walked inside. Pana woke up. At least, they thought they woke up. They had been continuously waking up for what seemed like days. Stars shone through the dark sky, dancing around the moon before blinking out of existence and being replaced by cascades of leaves. In between those sights, Pana roamed their village even though they were sure that they had left. Sometimes they went fishing, while other times they explored the nearby snow caves. Pana was surprised when they discovered the dragon, but then remembered that they had already discovered the dragon. When the sight of the log ceiling didn't change, Pana rubbed their eyes and blinked. The ceiling remained the same. Pana was lying in a mass of woolen blankets on the floor of a single-room wooden building. Leaves swirled around the room as gusts of air found their way through cracks in the walls, along with the occasional snowflake. Wooden barrels were piled onto their sides throughout the room, along with lawn bales of wheat. Dried meats hung from the ceiling. Though still cold, Pana much preferred their current location to the frozen cave they had rolled into. It would, however, be nice to know where exactly they had ended up. Until they found the dragon and determined that they were both safe, Pana wouldn't be comfortable. As they tried to get up from the floor, a man walked into the room. His face was smooth without any signs of facial hair. The top of his head was similarly shaved clean. The frayed woolen vest he wore had no sleeves, and his muscular, scarred arms were crossed in front of his wide chest. A chunk of his nose was missing. He didn't quite scowl at Pana, but he made no obvious sign of relief at seeing them awake. You're awake, was all he said. Pana started to nod before a wave of nausea rolled over them. They lay back down. The man seemed to understand and brought over a water skin. He watched as Pana sipped tentatively, the inflow of water simultaneously refreshing and painful in their empty stomach. Again, the man seemed to know what Pana needed, holding out a plate of food. Pana grabbed a cracked nut and sucked the liquid sloshing inside the shell. Almost instantaneously, they felt warmer. After half an hour of picking at the food and the occasional sip of water, Pana put the plate down and looked up at the man. The man said nothing, his mouth opened as if he were about to speak, but then it closed again. His hand rose a few inches, made an awkward twirl in the air, and dropped back down to his side. If he had plans to speak, they were interrupted by a loud squeal from the door. Pana rose suddenly before falling back to the floor, their body not yet able to hold itself up. You're awake, two children ran into the room. Cut it out, Sab. They don't want to hear you yelling. Where did you come from? Who are you? Are you cold? Does the dragon fly? Did you fly here on the dragon? Why hasn't it eaten you yet? Is it going to eat us? Pana looked to the man as if to ask if they were his kids. His mouth twitched. Ezra, Sab, calm down. You're exhausting me, and I didn't just wake up after being out for four days. Had it really been four days? No wonder Pana felt so exhausted. They did their best to sit up a little straighter. The kids had stopped running around, but they looked as if they were about to levitate off the ground. They were bouncing so much. Where is Wave Skimmer? Pana asked, forcing the words out of their throat like stones. Under all the wool blankets, Pana had felt warm, but speaking made them realize just how frozen their body still was. Confused for only a moment, the man responded, The dragon is safe. It's been sleeping outside. I didn't know what to feed it, so... Pana smiled. He's... Veg vegetarian. The children's faces glowed with excitement. Sab reached into her pocket and grabbed a Jinro nut before she and Ezra ran out of the room, leaving the door open behind them. After a few moments, the deep green eye of Wave Skimmer appeared in the doorframe. It blinked rapidly as it caught sight of Pana. Pana's voice hurt too much to speak, 
but they tried to communicate to Wave Skimmer just how comforting it was to see him through their eyes. A wave of warmth, even more powerful than that induced by the Jinro nut, washed over Pana. They had forgotten the man standing nearby. He coughed and said, Hmm, well, I'll come back and check on you in a few hours. If you're feeling up to moving, we'll have you join us for dinner. He took a few steps toward the door, and then added, My name's Naka, and you had better not have brought anything with you that will harm my kids. Sab and Ezra helped Pana walk from the barn to the main house, propping Pana between them. When they made it to the house, they lowered Pana into a chair and made sure that their guest could sit without help before sitting down themselves. Naka had already set the table, having cooked a meal of tubers and meats. Little was able to survive this far north, so there wasn't much in the way of variety. Wave Skimmer couldn't fit inside the house, so he remained outside. Naka had brought the dragon some tubers and cheese from the Yorbacks and a hot cauldron of stew. In between tentative nibbles, Waveskimmer looked through the window to make sure the humans were still at the table. Pana felt reassured by the sight of his large green eyes and his calm blue scales. Naka remained quiet for most of the meal, letting Sab and Ezra ask their guests questions and tell stories of their own. They explained that the tall things sticking out of the snow that weren't ice were called trees, and that they were actually living beings. Pana listened with interest when they explained how they put plants into the ground and took care of them as they grew. After claiming that they once spotted what they believed was a giant flying wolf that ran to the top of a dawn tree before leaping into the air, Naka finally interrupted. So, Pana, he said. I didn't realize that dragons were real. Pana knew that Naka would begin to try to figure out the chain of events that had led Pana and Waveskimmer to his doorstep. They didn't know if that was a story that they could tell. But they did owe the man something. He did, they thought, save their life. He... well, I didn't realize dragons were real either. They glanced outside and looked at Waveskimmer's eye. Waveskimmer, we met about a year ago. How did you meet? Are there other dragons? Are they as cool as Wave Skimmer? Asked Sab. Ezra nudged her. He said, Hey, let them breathe, why don't you? Pana stifled a laugh. Naka nodded at them to continue. He, I was... Yes, there are other dragons. Pana grabbed their cup and downed a mouthful of water. My village, or... The village I grew up in. I mean, no one knew about the dragons. But there's quite a few of them out there. I'm sure the villagers and the dragons get along well, am I right? Said Naka. Well, started Pana, but they were interrupted by Ezra. You came from the village? Are there a lot of people there? What are they like? Sam glanced over at Pana. See what I have to deal with? He tells me to ease up on the questions, and then asks them all himself. So unfair. Enough, said Naka. His kids quickly quieted down, though Pana could see the glint of more questions building behind their eyes. The village you come from, it's just above the frozen harbor on a hill, yes? Pana nodded, amazed that this man, whom they had never met, knew of the village. No one survived outside of the village. There was nowhere to go. Or at least, that was what Pana had believed as they ran away. Everyone in the village knew that those who wandered out into the frost never returned. Even as Pana took their first step out of the door, they believed they would freeze to death. But then they had woken up here, in the warmth of Naka's barn. How do you know about the village? I thought... No one can last more than a day outside the village. I did. Naka gazed out of the window for a moment. His eyes seemed to be slightly out of focus, as if he were looking through a blizzard, trying to pick out the shapes standing between the snowflakes. Hana waited for a moment before asking, How? Another moment passed before Naka responded. 
Life in the village was hard. Life anywhere is hard. The world is so cold, and it's hard to feed yourself, let alone a family. He turned his gaze toward his kids, and he almost smiled. A man appeared one day. No one knew where he had come from. He would sit in the great hall and tell his tales to the people. I was fascinated by him. I always dreamed of exploring beyond the village, and here was a man who told me that there were other villages out there. Things called trees, snow that would flow between your fingers and onto the ground if you held it for too long. Not everyone was enamored by his stories. The village leaders thought he was threatening their way of life and wanted him to leave. In order to survive in the cold, people need to work together. And they believed, correctly, that he was inspiring some villagers to think about the outside world. They dragged him to the edge of the village and told him not to come back. As I watched him disappear into the snow, I ran after him. We traveled for a few weeks. I can't tell you exactly how we survived. I remember it like a dream. It was cold. I was hungry. We huddled in igloos that night to hide from the wind and dug ourselves out of them each morning. I lost three toes and part of my nose. And then we arrived here. Imagine my fascination at seeing what lay beneath the snow for the first time. Though you probably don't need to imagine it. He taught me how to grow my own food and take care of plants. We built this farm. We built a life here. And then after a while, I became pregnant and we started our family. We didn't die. And then, for the briefest of moments, Pana thought Naka may have been about to cry, but disregarded that idea almost immediately. He left. I woke up, and my husband was gone. Maybe he's dead. Maybe he continued to travel. I don't know. Sab stood up from the table and walked over to him. She wrapped her arm around his shoulders. He was brave, wasn't he, Dad? Hana wasn't sure what Naka would say next. This was the most he had spoken since they had woken up in the barn. Maybe this was all he had to say. Whether or not it was, all possible avenues of conversation were shut down when the table began to shake. Hana placed their hand on it and felt it vibrating beneath their touch. Even the walls began to tremble. Dust fell from the ceiling. Outside, the farm animals began to bray. Naka jumped to his feet and drew a long knife from his belt. He was outside before the kids could follow. They ran outside, leaving Pana behind. Pana lifted themselves up and had to grab onto the back of the chair to keep themselves from falling. The vibrating grew worse. Clutching at the wall, Pana made their way outside. Naka stood in the dark front path, looking out over the fields. Sab and Ezra had grabbed a hold of him and were peering around. Wave Skimmer bounded over from his position outside of the window, and Pana grabbed onto him to keep themselves from being thrown to the ground from all the shaking. Wave Skimmer, meanwhile, mumbled anxiously. Dad, what is it? asked Sab. But Naka didn't respond. His grip on his kids tightened. A shadow climbed out of the earth next to the Yorback pen. The large, leathery animals cried out in alarm and clambered toward the fence as the shadow continued to rise. It was difficult to make out, but Pana thought they could see three long tails swirling through the air and broad claws protruding from its front three feet. As powerful as the front legs appeared, there were no back legs. It pulled itself forward, dragging the latter half of its body along the dirt. It moved around the enclosure, periodically pausing and throwing its head into the air. It approached an older yorback that had remained curled up on the ground. Noticing its fellows moving away, it began to stand. But the other creature was too fast. It raised its middle leg and brought it down on the yorback, ripping it in half. 
At this point, the other Yorbaks began to run. One of them lowered its horned head and crashed through the fence, leading others along with it. Meanwhile, the creature carefully dragged its prey back into the earth, collapsing the tunnel behind it. In the morning, Pana, Waveskimmer, and Sab went to search for the missing Yorbaks in the west, while Ezra and Naka went east. After walking for a few miles without encountering any of the creatures, Sab took them south along a tall, rocky ridge. Waveskimmer lifted them onto the rocks and then walked below them. Let's take a break, suggested Pana. They were still not fully healed, and after hours of struggling to keep up with Sab, they could use a rest. They whistled to Waveskimmer, and he paused, sitting at the base of the rocks. Sab sat next to them and pulled out some food from the bag she was carrying. The two ate together. With her mouth full, Sab was unusually quiet. But she ate fast, and when she was done, she asked, Do you know any songs? Songs? asked Pana. I mean, not off the top of my head. I was never good at remembering lyrics and such. There's this really nice one that Dad taught us when we were really young. He used to sing us to sleep. He still does it if we ask. I can sing it for you if you want. That's not necessary. Here I go. Here I am, in the snow. There really isn't much room to grow. I'm safe at home. I'm fed and warm. I can't help but think there must be more. There he was, in the sun. Together we decided to run. We found the earth. We found the trees. Finally, we can live as we please. Then you came, small and new. This place is where our family grew. Wherever you go, whatever you see, the proudest dad will always be me. The sawn was light and soft and it reminded Pana of nothing important. Some tears had begun to form in their eyes, but they shook their head and stood up, preventing Sab from noticing them. We should get going, they said. <laughs> Who knows how far the Yorbacks have gone while we've been sitting here. Maybe we should try climbing to the top of the ridge. We can see more from there. If they aren't up there themselves, we may spot them. I can't imagine our Yorbacks climbing up onto these rocks, admitted Sab, as Pana made their suggestion. They've always stayed within the fenced area, and that's about as flat as you can get. Not a single rock in the field. Same with the Yorbacks in our village, but there is a mountain nearby that I, um, well, I visited it. I thought you said no one was supposed to leave the village, Sab gasped. And when I would visit the mountain, I noticed that a bunch of Yorbacks uh, liked to congregate there. Have you ever looked at their feet? asked Pana. Sab shrugged, and Pana continued. If you do, you'll notice that they have three long claws. Two in the front, and one in the back. Not like wave skimmers' claws. They don't slice through things. But they do help the Yorbacks grab onto the rocks and climb over them. So I'm betting that we'll find the ones that ran off from the farm somewhere up here. Sab gave Pana an appraising look. I'm impressed. I've lived with these animals my whole life, and I couldn't tell you any of this. You really know them. Now it was Pana's turn to shrug. You know a ton, too. I had no idea what a tree was until I met you. I just spent a lot of time watching them back home, but I couldn't have told you what a tree was before I met you all. This place is incredible. They gestured to the dawn trees. Below them, Wave Skimmer walked around the trunk of a particularly large tree. Try as he might, he could not reach around it, extending his neck upwards. His head hit a branch, depositing snow all over him. Pana and Sab laughed and continued to leap over the rocks as they resumed the search. Despite having spent time observing the Yorbaks near the village, 
Pana had never seen anything quite like the creature that had attacked them the previous night. As they thought about it, they could see the creature in their mind rising out of its tunnel and lifting its head into the air. Has that creature attacked the Yorbax before? They asked Sab. Sab grunted as she pulled herself up onto a higher ledge. No, I thought I knew everything that lived in the forest, but I've never seen anything like that. Have you? Pana was about to say they had not when they noticed Wave Skimmer had stopped. He threw his head into the air and Pana saw his nostrils flare. His head swiveled and then remained fixed on one direction. With an excited bark, Wave Skimmer bounded forward along the ridge. Pana and Sab followed above. When they caught up to the dragon, they saw that he had vacated the ground and now sat in front of a group of three Yorbaks. Wagging his tail, he lowered his head closer to the animals as if to make sure they were the ones they had been looking for. Hey, we found some, exclaimed Sab. Pana nodded. They patted a proud wave skimmer on the snout and took a step closer to the nearest Yorbak. As they neared it, the wind shifted, blowing from the Yorbaks to Pana. It smells, they thought. Then, of course. Five hours later, Pana, Waveskimmer, and Sab had managed to locate most of the herd and return them to the farm. Naka and Ezra had found the rest of them. Earlier that day, they had repaired the fence, and now they corralled all the Yorbaks inside. Ezra pushed plants and barrels along the ground, while Naka waved Sab and Pana over. Naka said, that's the last of them. They still seem a bit spooked, but I'm thinking we might have to move them. Though I'm not sure what good that will do if this creature can tunnel through the ground. He placed his hand onto his forehead. We don't even know if it will come back. If it does. Dad, Sab said softly. Pana has an idea, and I think it may work. Just as it had the night before, the ground began to tremble. Pana stared at the Yorbak pen from their perch in a dawn tree about twenty feet off the ground. Even in the tree, they could feel the shaking. Beside them, Ezra and Sab did their best to remain quiet, hugging the tree branch. Naka sat as still as a glacier. Rising in magnitude for a few moments, the shaking suddenly stopped as the shadow of the creature lifted itself out of the hole it had dug in the earth. It stood on its three legs and raised its head into the air before walking to a pile of clipped fur and away from the Yorbaks. Fur flew all over when the creature slashed at the pile with its middle leg. It plunged its head forward to grab the beast it thought it had slayed, but its jaws closed on nothing. Once again, it lifted its snout into the air before slashing at the fur. Frustrated, it moved away and pulled itself to a different pile of fur. Meanwhile, the freshly shorn and washed Yorbaks watched the creature from the center of the enclosure. It should be able to find them, whispered Pana. I don't know if it is completely blind, but now we know for sure that it relies primarily on its sense of smell. How did you know? asked Ezra. Pana glanced at Wave Skimmer, sitting below them, and smiled. A friend pointed it out. They turned to Naka. I can't promise that it won't find the Yorbaks eventually. It could always stumble into them, or it might figure out a way around our trick. But at least your herd stands a better chance against it now. Thanks, said Naka, stoic as ever. That's... He stopped speaking and turned his head towards the path, running to the house. Sab tugged on his arm. What is it, Dad? Everyone quiet. He continued to look out below them and raise his hand, pointing down the path. Pana noticed flickers of light piercing through the trees. A hint of smoke blew through the breeze. The creature seemed to notice it too. In the middle of examining yet another pile of fur, it stopped and raised its head, facing the incoming wind. For a moment, it stood completely still. 
than it dove into the ground, rocking the world around it. From their position in the tree, Panna heard shouts. I need to go, Panna said. Sab and Ezra stared at them. The villagers followed you here? Asked Sab. Why? It's... I wish I could tell you. Wave Skimmer was looking up at them. He began to whine as the villagers drew nearer. They had reached the path, and their torches were no longer hidden behind the massive dawn trees. Sab reached for Panna's hand. But they'll be happy to see you. You're so helpful and nice. You saved our your backs. Now Panna could hear footsteps. <laughs> no, they... Thank you for helping me in Wave Skimmer. You took us in and helped me recover. You didn't have to. Naka nodded. I'll try to draw them off your scent, he said. He reached for the ropes they had used to climb the tree. Ezra, Sab, stay up in this tree until it's safe to come down. You hear me? But Dad... Do you hear me? They nodded in assent. Naka grunted. He slid down to the ground. Panna wanted to watch, to make sure that the father would be okay. But the longer they stayed, the more they endangered Ezra and Sab. Stay safe, they told the kids. If you see our other dad out there, said Sab, tell him that dad misses him. Panna nodded. They grabbed the rope and made their way to the ground. Wave Skimmer stood there, crouched, so that Panna could clamber onto his back. With a final glance at Naka, who stood in front of a group of people whose faces were indiscernible behind the glare of the firelight, Panna clutched onto Wave Skimmer. Let's go. Wave Skimmer ran through the forest and leaped into the sky. Below them, the lights were hidden by the dawn tree's leaves. There was no use worrying about Naka, Sab, and Ezra. Naka had survived before. He would lead his family to survive again. Anything else was unthinkable. Panna hugged Wave Skimmer's warm and scaly neck. Though they cried, they felt hopeful. They too would, hopefully, survive. Once again, they and their friend would have to put distance between themselves and the villagers. But this time, Panna was uninjured. This time, they believed they could indeed survive. And this time, Hana knew that an entirely new world lay before them. What kind of world it was, they didn't yet know. But together with Waveskimmer, they would find out.